uh, yeah, let's dive right in. So before we talk about any of the subject content, I want to talk about some of the goals that I have out of this webinar um, that go for any presentation or webinar that I give. Um, the first is the GI Joe principle. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that GI Joe, but knowing is half the battle. So the primary goal is to illuminate, enlighten, and teach. Um, so interested in your feedback and any thoughts about afterwards about um, how that teaching goes and, and the things that you've learned or the things you'd like to learn. The second is the Maximus principle. Um, so just like Gladiator and Maximus, uh, are you not entertained? Um, I do try to keep it interesting, entertaining, and humorous. Um, the last piece is the Dewey principle. Um, I try to avoid anything that's inaccurate, erroneous, or offensive. So if anything applies in that, I really try my best to avoid anything like that, but interested in your feedback and thoughts if so that I can learn uh, if I'm inaccurate and so that I avoid that I'm better next time in other cases. So who am I? Uh, George talked about uh, me being a product owner, owner here at Redox. Um, I'm a pipe enthusiast, and you'll understand after this presentation what exactly that means. Um, but that, it's a synonymous with HL7 analyst to start. Um, later in my career, became a CDA evangelist, uh, really big into documents and document exchange. And again, more to come on what that means exactly. And then uh, lastly, an API enthusiast. So in terms of um, in terms of APIs and the newest technologies. Uh, I think they're right up there with with IPAs as evidence in that uh, in that photo. That's not me. So why are we having this webinar? Um, there's a famous famous uh, XKCD comic, how standards proliferate, proliferate, um, and it's true. It honestly is not just in healthcare but everywhere. Um, the ways that we encode data, the ways that we transfer data, the ways that we try to make agreements tend to build up over time. Um, the graph below sort of shows over time the growth of standards in healthcare. Um, it's not precise in name. It's just meant to give you the idea that over time, uh, we've seen healthcare come in the 1970s and 80s. The standards pile up on top of each other. And hopefully, there's a plateau in sight, um, not necessarily because of us stopping to innovate and create the right standards for the use cases of the time, but um, hopefully because we're deprecating old ones and, and building towards a better future. So what exactly is a standard? A standard is an agreed upon method for connecting systems together, um, at least in this context. So standards exist in other industries outside of healthcare, um, but there are consens consens agreements made by consensus between parties. So a group of people in a specific industry or industries get together and say, it's better if we worked on this together, if we agreed upon how things are going to, to work. They may pertain to security, data transport, data format or structure, or the meanings of codes or terms. I'll explain on the next slide what that mean, what those four areas are, um, but it's a good way of, sort of segrega segregating the different standards we talk about in healthcare. I like to take a step back and make analogies quite often. And in this case, I, th I think of it as an analogous to learning a language. When you learn a language, you learn grammar, you learn words, you learn the proper ways to exchange them between people. Um, systems that vendors create use standards to speak the same language, speak it in a way that they both understand, writing or reading, um, and communicate back and forth. Ultimately, a standard is a product. Um, this group of people, this industry, these pe the, the people that have gotten together and created a standard are hoping that people adopt it, are hoping that people use it, are hoping that it meets needs. If it doesn't do that, uh, it's not really successful. And we'll talk a bit more about that on a secondary slide. Um, what's interesting about a product is it's built on consensus, oftentimes between competitors. So that makes it unique outside of other products, products that a, a specific vendor um, or a specific person might create. So over here, you can see everyone's speaking a different standard, a different language, it's probably a really fun party. So let's dive into some examples. Transport standards. So this covers, and there, you'll see acronyms like SFTP, SMTP, MLLP. Um, 
These are all ways in healthcare, but also outside of healthcare that data is transferred from point A to point B. And it's very common in the internet age to see HTTPS and healthcare reuses a lot of those standards that are derived from other industries or perhaps are cross industry. Next up is security. So we've defined in some ways how data is going from point A to point B. Um, how are you ensuring that the data that is sent is the right data, that no one's sitting in the middle, that the right people have authorization and authentication to that data? Um, that gets into sort of subgenres of security standards, but a few of the things you'll see there are IPsec VPNs, mutual TLS, basic authentication, OAuth, or if you're really fancy and cutting edge, JWT, JSON Web Tokens. Sometimes, and you'll see between transport and security, there's an there's a you know some HTTPS that actually implicitly implies um, certain security standards. So something to know about standards is that these different realms often overlap and aren't so clean um, and might self-reference self other standards. The next up is content standards. So things like HL7 v2, X12, C, uh, CCDA, CDA, and CPDP, these are all the ways, the what's. What are the topics that we are conversing back and forth when we're speaking our language? What are the things uh, that we expect us to send and when do we expect to send them? Um, there's a lot of meat on this bone, so we'll dig in a little bit closer on subsequent slides. And within the content, we even have another layer of what do the specific words mean? What are the, how do you define um, each data element in a way that it's universally understood? Things like LOINC, SNOMED, RxNorm, are all different code sets or terminology uh, vocabularies. So when I'm speaking HL7 version two or X12, I'll use the words from the dictionary and the dictionary would be LOINC or SNOMED or RxNorm. Um, and those just cover different topic types. So LOINC is typically a code set and a dictionary for lab tests and lab related things. Uh, RxNorm would be for medications, CVX for vaccinations, ICD-10, uh, for diagnoses. So those dictionaries ensure that when you're speaking a certain uh, grammar, you know, that's defined by those content standards, that it's universally understood. Today's presentation is mostly going to focus on content standards. It's not because I don't like transport or security or, co or co coding. Those are great. Uh, and they're really interesting too. Uh, but it's a lot of ground to cover. So for this starter webinar, we're going to start with uh, the content, the, the sort of the what's and the grammar of the different languages we speak in healthcare. So what's not a standard? Um, a standard is something that's built by consensus. So a vendor proprietary method for transport security content or co code sets typically is not a standard. If it is universally adopted, it may become what's called a de facto standard, uh, that is, no standards body has approved it, but everyone is using it. Um, that's things that are not standards are not necessarily bad. I wanna sort of po point out that there are very healthy developer ecosystems and systems of data exchange that don't necessarily rely on a standard, but rather uh, where there's one or two vendors, vendors they may um, use those vendors proprietary models and, and play in that ecosystem. So. Apple with iOS, Android with, um, you know, or Google with Android, you know, their systems of data exchange for developers uh, are pretty proprietary and have plenty of things that are based on broader standards, but because of their, their market dominance, they offer a developer ecosystem uh, and the sort of outcomes that standards hope to achieve. A lot of times the things that they come up with migrate and are incorporated by standards bodies uh, and approved it by standards bodies as standards. Salesforce, another example of you know, the, the way they are a dominant player in the, the uh, CRM space, their platform and the, the ways that they define data exchange uh, become sort of a de facto standard. So historically, a proprietary non-standard method was viewed as a barrier to entry um, because it was associated with bad documentation, 
that it was, you know, ex- associate with expense, ridiculous expense, um, people charging um, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to connect. Uh, the, the incentives were misaligned. It was, you know, integration and interoperability was used as a, a cudgel to sort of prevent people from competing. That's not necessarily gone away, but in today's internet-enabled era, um, with some of these players that we've just talked about, the platform approach, the idea of utilizing proprietary proprietary methods as differentiating features to provide a superlative developer experience, to provide a superlative user experience, is becoming more popular. And that aligns the incentives sometimes. Not always, and it's not in healthcare. That's not necessarily the case yet, but you can see with all scripts or Athena Health as EHR vendors, um, they've used their proprietary APIs um, and created a developer experience that is sort of leading in healthcare. Um, so the outcome, the outcome of enabling interoperability, enabling frictionless data exchange, is, is achieved sometimes by proprietary methods. That usually comes with open documentation, superlative support, broad marketing and distribution channels that otherwise might not even be available through standards. Um, so just want to point out that standards fill a void and help advance uh, and provide superlative de- developer experiences, um, consensus, but um, there, are, there are benefits and there are times where proprietary standards can be, very, can be a positive thing for the industry. So who makes standards? Well, consensus-based standards committees or standards development organizations make standards. The first one to know about is HL7 International. Um, HL7 is uh, a pretty old, not the oldest standards uh, committee in um, healthcare. We'll get into the history of standards in a bit, but um, they make the broadest and most widely used standards. So HL7 version two, CCDA, FIRE, are all things that you'll hear or either have heard or will hear as you dive into the realm of healthcare development and data exchange. Um, Their focus is typically connecting the EHR to to systems around it, both internal to the hospital and external, often with a clinical focus, but they do have some financial um, exchange elements. Next up is DICOM. Uh, DICOM is uh, Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine. Um, It comes out of uh, another group called ARC NEMA, um, which was a group of radiologists got together and said, we want to digitize imaging. How do we do that? Uh, The best way to do that is to create this standard. So they maintain everything around sort of robust diagnostic images um, and dealing with imaging modalities within the hospital. X12, Uh, X12 is an interesting one. It's not necessarily healthcare specific. Um, It deals with sort of cross industry, transportation industry, um, supply chain, uh, which is not unique to healthcare, but some of the transactions like claims, referrals, um, and the interactions between um, healthcare systems and payers are defined in X12. some things to, things to note, HL7, international, there are variations on regional level. Um, so you'll find HL7 has overlap uh, with HL7 Netherlands or HL7 Germany, but they may have customized it to their use cases. DICOM, international, um, X12 is US specific. IHE, integration, integrating the healthcare enterprise. So this is an interesting one where they don't, they're sort of, making standards that define the roles of different parties when using other standards. So getting kind of meta, um, they may say, hey, you're using HL7 in a lab context. Here's how you should be using each of these HL7 um, message types for different roles. They've also played a little bit into creating their own content standards. So that's why they're included on here. ASTM, um, this is the Association of Standardization of Testing Materials, I think, something along those lines. Um, They don't make as many for our use case. They did historically, and we'll talk about them in that history of healthcare standards a little bit later. 
NCPDP. Um, so this deals, this is a, a group that formed out of pharmacy benefit managers, pharmacies, and other people that play in the medication process. Uh, and they got together to create the standards around exchange of prescriptions, medical history between organizations. Okay, so if you like standards, the thing you'll like more than standards are standards for standards. Um, to become an accredited body that can create standards, you actually have to get approved, them approved by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, or ISO, the International Standards Organization. Um, you'll find that the US is doing what we do best. We sometimes, in the case of X12 versus GS1, or in the case of ANSI versus ISO, there's a US specific organization that does something and an international specific organization that does something. Um, ANSI and ISO collaborate quite a lot. X12 and GS1, I think, also collaborate a little bit. Um, but just know that oftentimes the US has broken off or perhaps created their own you know, metric versus uh, English standard pound versus kilo. Uh, we like to do those sort of things. So what makes a successful standard? Um, honestly, it's a high rate of industry adoption. If you wanna make a standard, um, it needs to be used by people. There's the, the field of healthcare is littered with the, you know, the, the dead standards or standards that aren't used that well, sort of, like Simba and, and Nala navigating the, the elephant boneyard. We're, I'm hoping today to give you a picture of where to go and not go. Um, but when you're considering, should I develop us to this standard? Should I use this standard? You should be thinking about the adoption that it has right now uh, for the, the usability uh, as you try and use it with different vendors and players, but also where adoption looks to be headed. So what drives adoption? Two main things, uh, consumer demand. So if the standard is well-designed, it meets the, the needs of the user base, the use cases that people are trying to solve. It's well, if it's well-documented, um, that also propels the success. Um, if you have open, easy-to-use documentation, people can, will develop up to that rather than creating their own variation, or worse, reading it and implementing it the wrong way. Um, easy to use, so are the transactions simple? Is the data mapping simple? Um, that gets them people up and running, that gets them uh, using it in, in production or in testing environments. Software development kits and testing tools are really valuable to help people get moving quicker. Um, so that, that's valuable in terms of driving that demand. And then if in, in the expensiveness or whether or not it's free can help adoption. Standards like X12 cost a lot of money. Standards like Fire do not. And that creates a different uh, level of access to that standard and adoption of that standard. The other piece is sort of de jure. Uh, de jure is, I think, is the term. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but by law, standards. So if the government requires something, then it be, by, by in effect, gets wide deployment, high adoption. Some of the most successful standards like NCPDP or X12, many of their standards were required by the government that dr and drove adoption. CCDA for also um, widespread because of meaningful uses requirements of adoption across the industry. Um, and like I mentioned before, de facto standards can arise. So when somebody, when an organization is in a certain industry is so um, dominant or has not always dominant, but has a good enough idea uh, that it can become a de facto standard. And eventually those de facto standards or de jure standards are generally incorporated back and approved um, by consensus-based committees. So why do people do this? Why do people um, donate their time? A lot of these standards committees are people, are large groups of industry vet, uh, vendors, industry uh, collaborators, patients, whatever it might be, all working out of their free time to help uh, develop, design, and deploy these standards. Um, if you ever read the book Drive, it talks a lot about building the common good and, and that sort of thing. So I like to think the number one reason is to build a common good, to build something that can be used by later generations, that can be reused, that make uh, everyone's lives easier. Um, 
Second is building a better user experience. When people, when vendors are in agreement, when there's a single way of doing and communicating data, uh, it builds a better user experience. Like the woman on the right here, um, she's using uh, numerous standards, HTTPS, um, you know, it, all the inter things, the standards that go into internet standards play into her ability to have her phone, um, you know, and be able to use it on, at the coffee table. As we go down and think about less of people acting in the public good and in their own interest, um, it could be to even the playing field by, by making a common standard. Um, it allows vendors who are smaller or less competitive um, to compete and in, 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 uh, to play into the ecosystems. Um, because if they're, if they're shut out by a big vendor, they don't really have a chance necessarily. Um, it can also be a competitive differentiator, like this person running ahead in the race. Um, if they time it right, they can be utilizing features um, that somebody else has already done a lot of work on. It. Somebody else has, all these standards development organizations have been thinking about for months or years. So rather than having to reinvent the wheel, they can use that wheel and perhaps leap out ahead. So something about standards is historically these groups in the 80s and 70s were meeting in person, typing it up, mailing it out. Um, so there was high expense. You had to join and pay for the standards. Um, over time, they've migrated to PDF and Word documents. So you'll see a lot of them in that format. But the best and newest is online open documentation. Um, ideally, all the, the all the standards we see out there are shifting towards that online open documentation to be competitive with proprietary APIs and proprietary methods of exchange. Because that's the new, the new standard for standards documentation is um, open, open access, get as many people onto it, increase adoption, that sort of thing. So it'd be silly as a standards uh, development organization um, to not at least consider this. Uh, another thing that we're not really going to go into, but is how are they funded? How do they exist? They have to make money in some ways, but uh, we've seen organizations like HL7 um, shift to online open documentation and monetize and, and sort of pay for the work that they do um, via webinars, via you know classes, things like that, which ultimately I think are a better path in terms of bringing the right people into the community helping the community grow, helping adoption. But not all organizations have made that jump yet. Jump, uh, X12, NCPDP still live in a sort of pay to play, closed documentation world. So you'll hear a lot with interoperability about different levels of interoperability, semantic versus uh, syntactic and, and really sort of big brain, mega mind types of things. I think that's important to understand, but we're not gonna dive into that today. Something that's more important for, in my view is thinking about the trust paradigms of, that are used with different standards um, because identifying which one you're interested in allows you to understand the lay of the land in terms of tools avail available to you via standards. So the first and oldest is edge interfacing. So within a healthcare organization enterprise, um, hospitals want to connect point to point with other systems. So for instance, the EHR wants to connect to the radiology system and the lab system. These connections between the organization and provider app, um, we'll talk about the, the standards in use that uh, typically facilitate this, but this is the oldest trust paradigm. It's provider applications, it's use, hospital user applications, trying to link that all together within one clinic or one integrated delivery network. The second and more recent is enterprise interoperability. So how are we facilitating the exchange of information between enterprises, organization to organization exchange? Um, so whether that's between two hospitals, a hospital and a clinic, a skilled nursing facility, or other covered entities, that type of exchange is a little bit different. And because um, trusting within the edge interfacing scenario is trusting yourself, you, you know, you're, all your users are within one organization. Trusting between organizations is a different exchange uh, method. Uh, 
Lastly, and most recently, is patient authorization. So there's legislation coming down the pipe in regards to this that's going to change this, that's opening it up in a big way. But um, ultimately, this is consumer-facing applications. If I'm on my, my iPhone and I want to have an app that connects to my hospitals, um, there needs to be a mechanism, a trust paradigm, such that I can authenticate and say, hey, this is Brennan Keeler. I'd like my data. I'd like to write things back to my, to my hospital or communicate back to my hospital. Um, so that trust paradigm is new and growing. I love threes, so let's do another one. Uh, there's three main content format categories. Um, again, from oldest to newest. EDI, the limited formats. Um, and EDI stands for Electronic Data Interchange. XML, Extensible Markup Language. So as you can tell, it's a, it's a markup language, but has been in the internet era, the start of the internet era, it became very popular for structured data exchange. And then JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. These are the main ones. There are other ones, value pair. Um, DICOM notably doesn't fall, really fall into any of these three formats. But um, for most use cases, this is it's important to know these three. So what's EDI? What does delimited mean? So as we jump in, you can see this is an X12 message. The X12 message is delimited or separated by um, stars, asterisks. So the different data elements on paper, if you don't know the format, if you haven't read the grammar book of X12, you can't really tell what's going on. You can sort of see things in there like Etna um, or you know different levels of consciousness, the different data elements, and perhaps guess backwards what that particular field means. But um, in terms of never having seen this before, looking at it, you don't really know what this is all about. The, the advantage of EDI and the reason that it exists is, is back in the, the day of edge interfacing, um, you know, it's very simple connections between systems within a hospital or within an enterprise. Um, you didn't really, you know, what you would just have your different systems configured to understand what was going on. So some other examples, HL7v2, and this format actually is ER7. So it's not, it's usually just called HL7v2. 99% of the time if you hear HL7v2, they mean this specific format, but the full formal name is HL7v2 ER7. And that means it's delimited by pipes um, and uh, other and other key characters that are defined here up in the top left. Lastly is GS1 EANCOM. Uh, there's plenty of other EDI formats. I don't want to limit it just here, but here, here's three examples. Again, delimited uh, into segments by new lines. And then between each data element, there's plus symbols. So it's plus symbol delimited. So if we dive in real quick, uh, this is the HL7 message. Um, you'll see each segment. Uh, and I'm not going to go deep into how do you read HL7 messages? But as an example, um, each segment is delimited by a pipe symbol. Um, and then on each new line, there is a different segment with different um, groupings of, of data. So if I look at this PID segment, it's all about the patient demographics. Um, and it actually wraps around here onto the next line. Then there's an NK1 segment that deals with next of kin, PV1, which deals with the visit. AL1, which deals with the allergies. Again, not illogical, but you need the grammar book. You need to either have memorized the grammar book or have a, a deep knowledge of it or be referencing it to understand what each field actually is about. Uh, EDI also, I guess, is valuable because it's sort of compact. It's a lot of data. So went back in the heyday of, of trying to connect your hospital systems and slow speeds of communication, kind of valuable to have a compact data format. Anyway, next up is XML. So XML is a little bit better uh, in the sense that it's a, a little more readable. So if I look at this GS1 XML, I can start to see the different tags. And XML is defined um, with an opening tag and then a closing tag. Uh, and in between those tags, there's there's information. So you know, I've, I've never, I haven't looked deeply at GS1 XML, but I can say, okay, the sender, there's an identifier for it. There's contact information. So 
the advantage of XML has always been, or at least over EDI was, hey, this is this is readable. Um, and there's a lot of other features and get, we can do a deep dive about XML as a, as a markup language. But um, the main one is the human, the computer, the computer computability, as well as human readability. Uh, so I mentioned before HL7 v2 ER7. There's also HL7 v2 XML, and it's gross and nobody uses it. So, but I mean, what's the advantage of XML when it still has like MSH3, MSH4, nothing? Um, uh, and Fire, Fire has XML format. So the newest and hottest standard um, is has you know XML for people that prefer that. So we did, I talked through, oh, NCPDP now is all XML. Um, so here's an exa another example. Um, I already talked about the tags. So this became popular uh, 1990s, late 1990s, 2000s. Everyone starts to switch everything to XML. Um, and then at the turn, the, as we entered 2010s, people grew, start to get fed up with it. They said, okay, well, it's really verbose. It's a lot. Of, you know, why do I have to, you know, repeat the tags here and there? Um, the complexity of some of these XML standards starts to skyrocket. So, luckily, in 2000s, but codified in 2014, JSON came onto to the the scene. It's just simpler um, and just cleaner. So it has the human readability, um, but you know, it, it has um, and it's usable easily usable in JavaScript. Um, frameworks, which is a you know increasingly very popular, Node.js, React, etc. Um, so people like the JSON quite a lot, and there's a Fire JSON format, which I'm a big fan of. Redux, not necessarily standard, but um, is uh, using the JSON format as well. So as well as Athena's API, Allscripts API, um, most modern web APIs use JSON. Um, as a format. So to really understand standards, I love to, I love to tell the history. Um, and to go, I guess we have to go back to the beginning, really the dawn of time, an era and an age before writing. I don't think anyone was writing back then. I'm talking, of course, about the 1970s, um, well before I was born. Uh, so the first piece of information in history I like to dive into, um, the OSI model. Um, so some smart people got together and codified the OSI model, so open systems interconnection, uh, a framework to say, here is, um, you know, here are the different layers of communication between uh, systems, not necessarily in healthcare, uh, but really cross industry. Um, it's important later on because the seven in HL7 is derived from application the seventh layer, the OSI layer seven. So, uh, and I apologize, this timeline, uh, you'll see the increments aren't really uniform, so just bear along with me. Um, so later in 1978, cool outfits. This guy probably was involved with OSI. Uh, unclear, but I'm guessing. Uh, 1979, ANSI X12. So the software development organization, ANSI X12 was founded. They started to work on standards. They didn't come up with it necessarily right off the bat, but um, grocery stores and transportation dove in first uh, into to uniform standards. If you think about the UPC code, that's a standard. That's a standard way of uh, communicating the information um, electronically. Uh, late in 1979, roughly midnight of December 31st, 70s end. So we have to move on. So a pretty rad era comes up next, the 1980s, uh, an era of Ronald Reagan and Miami Vice. So 1981, uh, notably UCSF starts connecting. So they did some pioneering work. Uh, actually, my hometown, I'm in San Francisco right now. Um, but And UCSF is pretty awesome. But they show it here because they 
connected their registration laboratory pharmacy and radiology systems over their local network. So edge interfacing connections with their in, in their enterprise. They didn't use a standard because none existed. They came up with their own proprietary method. 1982, this awesome picture, Parrot as an accessory, it's an all-time high. I believe it, it stopped in by the 90s. Again, not my time. Um, ASTM and ARC MEMA. So uh, the, they both come up with sort, you know, start, sort of start their work on different standards. Um, ASTM was focused on lab information systems and instruments. And they said, how do we get this data out of our, our lab instruments into our lab information systems? Um, and they, they honed in and put their work into creating a standard that can be seen here, uh, delimit, a comma delimited one. Uh, ARC NEMA, the, again, the, the group of radiologists thinking about imaging starts to, you know, incorporate and starts to think about how do we communicate uh, imaging data, radiology images. 1984, um, Don Simborg go, says, hey, the, you know, this work we did at UCSF, I, it's really, it's really great that we should get more people using what he was calling Statland. Um, this is not a picture of him. This is a picture of Steve Jobs, uh, who released the, the, his Macintosh at the time. So to give you, you know, some mental placing in history. But Simborg, you know, very standard Bay Area. He said, "Let me take this work. Let me try and monetize and commercialize it." So 1985, Statland is struggling. They're they're not able to really get other other hospitals to use this. They can't get other vendors to adopt their standard. Um, so they, they see both in a benevolent way, but also in a, a how do we stay commercially viable way. Um, they see open non-proprietary standards as necessary for their survival. Meanwhile, uh, a group of smart people get together and create Medix, uh, Medical Data Interchange. It didn't last very long, but uh, they were very focused on the reference information model of their standard and not necessarily the, the practical implications and implementation details. So we'll, we'll circle back on them in a bit, but just for reference, people have been thinking about it in a very academic way about standards for a long time. So 1987 rolls around. Um, Simborg's work and uh, many other people's works um, come together. Uh, I think there were 75 people at the first meeting of HL7. There were a few ones that dipped down in the 30s, and then uh, they came together and by 1987 came out with HL7 V1, which looks a lot like HL7 V2, um, but it was published. Like I mentioned, HL7 V2 looks a lot like HL7 V1 because it was just a rebrand. Uh, they wanted to show and express the maturity of their uh, standard, uh, so they just said, okay, we're going to call it V2. Uh, coincidentally, at the same time as the fall of the Berlin Wall. I don't know. So the 90s roll around. So standards begin to merge. Standards begin to, to we really see the adoption in the 90s. That's the, 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 the growth of standards. Everything that was born in uh, the 80s was incubated and grew to maturity or near maturity in the 90s. So ASTM and HL7 had a lot of overlap and they did this delicate dance of trying to stay harmonized, attend each other's meetings, but eventually a lot of that was incorporated, especially the lab work from, for ASTM was incorporated into HL7s um, because it was ultimately a subset of what HL7 works on. HL7 wanted to express all interactions in the healthcare domain whereas ASTM was focused just on lab, which is one small piece. We can see their legacy in a lot of the lab standards. Medex never really comes out with the standard, but the thoughts and the thought process and the people that worked on it eventually go on to work on HL7 version three, which we'll touch on in a bit. So ARC NEMA becomes DICOM. Um, they sort of rebrand and release their standard uh, their version three standard, and then it just takes off. It begins to be used to connect between picture archiving systems, PAC systems, and me and medical modalities, the radiology systems. But 
um, to start, but in, in different years since then, DICON has been extended to a lot of different imaging areas and also things like radiation therapy. So NCPDP also makes a standard at this point in 1997. Um, they came together and they said, you know, we really like X12, we really like HL7, we should make an ED, our own EDI standard. Um, so again, it's in a delimited format to start. Eventually they iterate and get to an XML format. Um, but again, NCPDP is focusing on the interactions between um, health systems and then, and then pharmacy systems that uh, typically those outpatient pharmacy systems that might receive prescriptions or have information about medical history. Uh, noteworthy, uh, IHE was born in 1998. So a group, again, founded by a number of radiologists to define what's the proper way for, um, for systems and, uh, and different roles in a healthcare enterprise to, um, to do the medical imaging process. So they focused on radiology. They said, you should use this standard in HL7 you know, at ordering. You should use DICOM at this point. Um, so their standards, again, define the roles and responsibilities and the different substandards to use in different um, role-based scenarios. In 1999, HL7 2.3.1 uh, was released. And it, even though we're up to 2.8.2 uh, or, or beyond maybe now, 2.9, um, 2.3.1, um, is still very very common in terms of what you see. Um, it was it was it was adopted as the industry standard, and while other while vendors will pick and choose things from subsequent standards, or perhaps are required in certain instances to use two point five point one, two point three, and that feature set that we see in two point three is really most common across the industry. So 2000s roll around. It's a you know a dark brooding era for HL7 in comparison to the rapid growth uh, and adoption of, of 2.3 uh, and HL7 2, just like Twilight and Robert Pads and um, dark and moody. So 2000s XML becomes a thing. Um, the rise of the internet really popularizes XML. It's codified, um, and people within Healthcare notice. Number a number of the, the standards organizations we we've talked about, GS1, X12, DICOM, HL7, have all they all start and turn their heads towards XML and say, ooh, that's shiny. Let's let's see how we can use it. Um, 2004, HL7 and NCPDP start to collaborate. Um, hospitals are using HL7, and pharmacies and others are using NCPDP script EDI format. Um, so they say, oh, let's map between them and we'll use that mapping effort so that each you know, party can use what they see as appropriate. Eventually that, that cooperation is hard, it's expensive, and NCPDP decides to, in later years, sort of say, yeah, no, actually you, should, you need to be using ours when you're communicating this data type. So hospitals will, and EHRs are required to use NCPDP when sending um, when sending prescriptions and when pulling down medication history. This, it goes to show that collaboration between standards development organizations can be quite difficult. Big year in the 2000s, the IHE drops XTS.B. Um, this is really important. It's, def it's later defined in Meaningful Use 2, but um, it's, a it's a transport standard that wraps around CCDA it's really useful in terms of exchange between healthcare organizations. HL7 version three, um, throughout the 2000s, HL7 said, you know what, let's use XML. Let's, we have a lot of problems with HL7 version two. It's, it's not precise enough. It needs to be precise. And 90% or more of the implementations needed to be, to be defined in the standard. It's, so what they did was they, they used XML format. They, said, okay, for every use case for, that we have in HL7 version two, 
We're going to have a, this reference information model. We're going to have really strict rules about every field and the coding on every field. Um, they spend a whole decade working on that. And it's not really a, su a success. Um, it's, it's something that is too strict and not doesn't give enough flexibility for implementation considerations. So for the, the differences of site by site, um, when there's a site by site need of the implementer, it doesn't allow the flexibility that, that uh, to give without breaking from standard. Anyway, 2010s, um, a return to normalcy, a return to, to something basic, just like this avocado toast where millennials took very basic ingredients and created something new again. Um, the growth of the API is something to note. You'll hear that word thrown around just as common as blockchain or, or AI, um, but APIs are a little more uh, real and, are, and actually are usable compared to AI or blockchain. Just kidding, if you, if you work in those industries, I have great respect, but um, just some humor. <laughs> This is a, a graph of the Google searches over time for API. So rattling through this, remote API used to mean I'm programming, let me expose something within code to other people in my uh, that are coding so they can use this and get a, a expected response. You know, Object-oriented pro programming, Java and C++, this was a popular idea. In the web era, that was taken further in web services. So XML APIs uh, for, in a service-oriented architecture were exposed, usually with a sort of a WSDL is what it's called to explain the format of that API. Again, XML is pretty complex, but it was new. It allowed Salesforce and eBay and others to be uh, become platforms to become uh, to allow developers to use their web services for different functions. Web APIs took this further, um, making JSON, RESTful, JSON, um, application programming interfaces, just lower overhead and barrier to entry for developers and others looking to use um, that input output mechanism. Public APIs, so again, sort of like taking it another step further, open self-service, no barrier, no, you can just immediately Google and go to a web page and read about the API really help advance adoption. So health API, 2014 is a big year for that. Um, even though there was a health API H data that a company called MITRE put together back, I don't know, 2008 to 2010, sometime there. Um, it wasn't really popular. Was, I think it was XML based. The website doesn't even exist anymore. But um, health APIs start to take off. Athena, Allscripts, Redox, and Fire, all sort of born in this era of um, let's make application programming interfaces that make it easy and easy for people to use. Let's decrease the overhead and the tribal knowledge that's necessary to, to work in healthcare. So back to our regular timeline. I just love timelines so much. I need to have like six of them in here. Um, meaningful use, talked about regulatory impact on standards. Meaningful Use 2 did a lot of things, and we could do a whole webinar on what, what the impacts of Meaningful Use are on physician happiness or uh, EHR use. But for our purposes here, it required CCDA support, um, both via a standard called Direct and, and also XDSP. Um, so it cemented it in the backbone of enterprise interoperability. So we see CDA, CCDA as a result everywhere in healthcare. All EHRs are supposed to support it. So Fire arrives, as previously mentioned. Um, JSON was encoded or uh, released as a standard um, framework in 2013, although it existed for a number of years. Healthcare IT, Graham Greve, uh, our founding father, jumped in and said, "You know, let's make a let's make an API. Let's make fast health in, uh, healthcare interoperable resources." Um, and that that standard since then has taken off in a big way. Redox was born in 2014, as noted before. Uh, R so Fire iterated over those four years in between. R4 is very uh, important to note because it's the first normative edition. And what that means is 
before that, it was a draft standard. People were saying, oh, let's, let's see what a patient resource could look like. Let's see what a medication resource could look like. Now for sections of the standard, they've guaranteed backwards compatibility. So fire shouldn't change um, when it, for certain resources as long as they're normative, or it should only change in ways that are backwards compatible. Additionally, we're guaranteed bad puns um, or good puns, depends on, your, depends on your view on puns for years to come. 2019, uh, notable, we talked about meaningful use too. Now we have new legislation on the horizon. My colleague Nick Hack gave a great uh, webinar on that recently, but ONC Cures and TEFCA, two different pieces, um, are gonna have two big output outcomes. And as they're written now, they still need to be finalized. What that means is CDA and XDS should be further solidified for enterprise interoperability through the care quality network uh, or framework rather and, and associated network uh, players. And then FHIR for patient authorization should see rapid growth and deployment. So for, for consumer-based access. So mapping that back, uh, what can you expect to see? How are standards used today? For edge interfacing, the dom still dominant standards and mechanisms that are used as is HL7 version two is by far still the most common way that hospitals and EHRs communicate with their ancillary systems. Although there's some vendor specific proprietary APIs um, for certain EHR vendors that might be used like Athena or Allscripts. Coming, FHIR is seeing some adoption in this area. It's not legislatively mandated or not nearly as strongly as let's say patient authorization, um, but EPIC in various ways is exposing FHIR, Cerner in various ways is exposing FHIR. Um, I would expect that for this use case, we're gonna see FHIR continue to grow um, and be hidden or be within sort of app, um, App programs like App Orchard or um, Cerner Code. Enterprise interoperability, CDA was enshrined. It's further enshrined um, through TEFCA. For payer use case, X12 and, and is, is defined in HIPAA. So even though there's a lot of work for payer to or, uh, between insurers and hospitals to, um, to, to, to sort of use fire in novel ways, X12 still plays a big role and until they update legislation, I'd expect X12 to, to be in, uh, in use. NCPDP for um, that enterprise interoperability uh, between hospitals and pharmacies. So across the SureScripts network, um, typically, but perhaps in other use cases. Some networks like Care Quality or Commonwealth are that play in enterprise interoperability are using FHIR or, or have work groups dedicated to FHIR, but the broad industry adoption is what matters, like we said before. So when will vendors support it? When will it be required by networks or by legislation uh, is what we have to sort of think and predict and, and talk about. And patient authorization, uh, legislation in 2015 sort of pushed uh, patient authorized APIs, utilizing your credentials to pull down your information. Um, some of that was implemented using FHIR, some through vendor-specific APIs. With ONC Cures, for the limited data set that, uh, that is defined in ONC Cures, uh, we'll see vendors likely be required to use FHIR. Coming up on time, so I should probably go faster. Standards of the future, uh, expect a lot of growth in FHIR. Um, ideally, and these are my opinions and not that those of Redox or, any, or really any guarantees, but fire as much as possible. Um, we'll see it in patient off. Hopefully it is extended to those other use cases. Um, overhaul of X12. Um, I think to have an EDI based standard sit in between a lot of work that's being done to on the DaVinci project to use fire between payers and and hospitals is kind of silly. Um, no offense meant to anyone on the call who works with X12, but um, right now requiring that, having that ancient standard required is, is slowing the innovation and improvement of those, you know, things like 
prior authorization or claims. Uh, DICOM, DICOM works really well or works well within your enterprise. In terms of enterprise interoperability exchange of images, it doesn't. Um, and there's a number of DICOM successors, XDSI and DICOM web that are in play, but it needs broader adoption to exchange images between enterprises and even with other third parties within an enterprise. Uh, NCPDP iteration, it's an XML based standard. It's, it needs improvements and it needs new features and things. Uh, there's a new version of NCPDP that was developed in 2017 that still hasn't seen adoption across the industry. So all of this is really complex. Uh, here's where I give you a small Redox, uh, you know, knowledgeable with what we do is we insulate applica developer applications from all that complexity. So all those point-to-point -point integrations that might need to occur um, are a lot of drain on uh, you as developers. You, when you have a certain use case, you're trying to solve for patients, providers, and other people in healthcare. Um, Redox makes that simple. So we're connected to a, a large network of 700 plus providers. We normalize and standardize all those standards uh, for you. So there's a single point of connection. So you authenticate with our, your a our API and then uh, the provider organization through Redox implementation and uh, tooling, we normalize that so that you connect once and can scale much more rapidly. Scale your reach, not your tech debt. We'll scan through this. There's additional resources I'd like to point out for you. So ONC's website on standards is nice as a primer. Uh, again, a further comparison of language and standards. Uh, and understanding some of those analogies I got into more deeply. A, a cool history of HL7 by Ringholm um, that gets in like, the, like there's interviews and all sorts of things. Uh, if you like that history, but you want more, I know that was quick and I scanned through a lot. I, there's a write up in a PDF that I made about the history of standards uh, and the trust frameworks in healthcare. We have our resource library that you can reference. You can join our developer community at community.redoxengine.com. You can check out our API docs at developer.redoxengine.com. My Twitter's here. Uh, and now 